Good morning. I am Joost Brent from the University of Utah, and it is my pleasant function to introduce Miko Hooper uh, for today's plenary lecture. And uh, Miko uh, is a rector, which is the president of Obo Academy in Finland, and is a is professor in inorganic chemistry. And I have known uh, Miko for several decades. Uh, he, I have special admiration for his work because uh, as an inorganic chemist, Miko made it his, his function to, to integrate fundamental chemistry with uh, practical and real industrial processes. And he was very successful in doing that and especially in the biomass uh, treatment or biomass uh, use area and also in the uh, pulp and paper industry. In fact, uh, he, uh, Miko is well known as an after dinner speaker for the, the, uh, in the pulp and paper industry dinners that occur every few years. Uh, he served as director of the national Combustion Research Program, or LAKI, in Finland in the 90s, and uh, made that an outstanding success. It was one of the, the it is one of the programs that one looks to as a as a model for multifaceted combustion research programs. He, he was a superintendent of research, at and director, uh, and president of the International Flame Research Foundation which is an organization that is dear to my own heart, and I'm really, he did a wonderful job there, too. He has published m many, many, many papers, and I won't list the number of, of where it was. And uh, uh, he's now also the, 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 the uh, chairman of the board of the ABO uh, Academy of Process Chemistry Center, a uh, center of excellence in research. So with that, I have to say that in addition, uh, Miko is a world-class tennis player, I've been told, and uh, a very accomplished jazz pianist. But I guess we'll have to wait for those uh, performances at a later date. For now, I'd like you to welcome Professor Hooper. Thank you very much, just for, for your very kind uh, introduction. Uh, Good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to start by, by thanking the, the uh, Combustion Institute for this, this great uh, opportunity to come and talk to you, and uh, particularly the program chair, uh, chairs, Assad Masri and Peter Glarbory. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. It is a, it is a pleasure, and it's, it's, a, it's an honor. I hope I can. I can meet the expectations, at least to, to some degree. Um, I also want to acknowledge my co-authors for this presentation, uh, Oscar Karström, Emil Vainio. They are my younger postdoc researchers who, who, who did, did a lot of help when we put together this presentation. I will speak about biomass combustion, and uh, my main focus will be biomass combustion in larger units. Uh, it is heavily increasing in Europe and in Northern Europe, and there is a lot of interesting technology around it. The large-scale combustion biomass can take place in, uh, as, uh, as co-firing with, together with, uh, with other fuels, can be also co-firing with, with coal, but then it can also be done in a separate uh, bio, large-scale biomass units. And here are two examples of such units. Uh, fluidized beds, the upper one is a circulating fluidized bed uh, by Foster Wheeler and the lower one is, uh, is a bubbling fluidized bed, another type of technology. And both of these are, are, are quite interesting when 
using biomass in large scale. For those of you who are not familiar with these kind of technology, here is, you get an idea of the size. This is the guy, guy you may, may be seeing here. They are very big units. Uh, one important trend at the moment is the increased interest into lower grade uh, biomasses. Uh, wood as such, which was the starting to all this technology, in fact, is a relatively easy fuel in many ways. But when the interest goes to, to lower grade biomasses, uh, many interesting things start happening at the one, one, on one hand. On the other hand, they are quite interesting uh, uh, fuels because they are uh, cheap in price and they are, uh, they are easily available. So people have now started more and more talking about opportunity fuels rather than uh, harmful wastes. However, now we come approach my, my topic of today, this poor, uh, poorer quality uh, fuels give a lot of uh, in, uh, challenges to design and operation. They are not straightforward to, you, to be used. And a lot of that has to do with chemistry, chemical uh, details. Uh, the devils are in chemical details, definitely in this, this business. And there is a lot of space for fundamental research which can support this development of technologies and the use of low-grade biomasses. So I will touch some part of that also. Uh, biomass is defined in different ways. This is a good one. Organic matter derived from living or recently living organism. Uh, and uh, uh, the graph which is used for coal, where we have hydrogen-oxygen plot, hydrogen to carbon ratio, oxygen to carbon ratio, uh, shows quite nicely how uh, biomasses relate to coals. So in this kind of graph, anthracite coals are down here, of course, very low hydrogen, very low oxygen. The younger coals will place themselves here. Brown coals, lignites, further ahead. Then comes an interesting group of fuels called peat. Uh, they are just in between before coming to the, to the biomasses. So, in a way, biomasses are very, very young coals, but from combustion point of view, they are much more than that. And, and there, is, there are many different, many uh, other aspects. In this kind of a graph, the heating value goes in this direction. And I have another picture showing also the same, same relationship. Here you see, uh, starting from anthracite, the Volatile content goes steeply up, and in fact, for most wood qualities or biomass qualities, we speak about 80 plus percent volatiles and 20 percent fixed carbon. Uh, the lower heating value, in the same way, goes down. So they have a low heating value, but on the other hand, as I mentioned, some of them are, are quite uh, available and, and, and inexpensive. Very importantly, they have uh, very different ashes as compared to coal. The whole ash chemistry is different. For instance, the ash indexes being used in coal have absolutely no relevance when it's about biomasses. Here is an example of one modern uh, large-scale unit using Biomass, it's a circulating fluidized bed in, uh, in uh, uh, Jakobstad, Finland. Here is also the guy, so it's a huge unit, 550 megawatts. And uh, it has the possibility to burn very different fuels. Extremely interesting concept, but very demanding. You cannot burn all of these fuels from zero to 100 percent. You have to know very well which combinations are, are possible. 
Uh, one additional point here is to show that also here where the main fuel used to be bark or still is bark or wood, but th there is an increasing interest to start using also something we call forest residue. Forest residue is the material that stays in the, in the forest after the, the paper guys have taken the logs. And this green material consists of branches and needles and so on. There is a big interest. There is also new technology to more efficiently collect that material and, and bring the material in the same trucks that I used for logs for this, this fuel. And then it can be burnt. However, if we take a look at the composition of wood, you see here immediately that things become more uh, demanding when using uh, green parts of the wood. L look at the potassium content. In wood, it is very, very low. In bark, higher. But when we go to twigs, the small branches, it's even higher. And uh, needles. And if somebody would be interested in just analyzing the annual growth, the potassium content is extremely high. So the more green material is there, in the, in the mix, the higher is the amount of ash forming elements, and it con concerns uh, all, almost all of the elements. These are the most important ash forming elements in biomasses alkali metals, phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine. And, and their chemistry, uh, there is similar chemistry in, in, in uh, coal firing also, but the key here is that. This is the main chemistry in coal firing. It's the minor chemistry, and the main chemistry is on the silicate, uh, aluminum silicate side. Uh, here is a summary of ash forming matter in different biomass fuels. And you see here that wood has a very low uh, ash content. And the, the champion here is rice husk, which where the ash content is or ash forming matter is 9%. This is element, uh, percentage element. So if we take it as an oxide, then it's uh, silicon oxide. This is almost pure silicon oxide, it's 20%. So rice husk is, is a very interesting biomass fuel also. I will come back to the composition of this just in a moment. Now, we, collected with uh, Emil and Oscar uh, here some locations in a big unit where chemical aspects play an important role when, when designing the unit or when operating the unit. And you can see that there are many locations, many aspects where chemistry comes in, where chemical knowledge is needed to be able to design or to be able to operate the unit. Uh, Fluidized bed, very special feature is the bed uh, sintering. Fluidized sand bed is sensitive. If it starts changing composition, it may start uh, forming larger particles and it may defluidize. Very, very difficult and common problem when using biomasses. Uh, nitrogen oxide chemistry requires good knowledge of air staging or vice versa. Uh, carbon conversion, something about fuel reactivity. Uh, additives are used. I don't go deeper into them. Uh, steam data, steam temperature, is really the key parameter where biomass combustion has big problems. I will come back to that. Uh, low temperature corrosion, of course, and emissions, and so on. So this I like to show to our students and, and try to motivate them to, to, to use and, and, and join us to do chemistry because it is badly needed here. I have chosen here uh, a few examples of the, of the more fundamental work and, and try to connect them to these, these problems. Uh, and they are deal with these four areas. And I start with uh, some words about biomass fuel uh, reactivity. Biomass particles burn, have the same stages of combustion as, as coal. Uh, there is a drying stage, 
normally there is more water in, in, in biomasses than, than in coal. Uh, the devolatilization stage, the char and the ash, the devolatilization is more important. 80% of the mass will disappear there. Also, the char properties are not only is the sm char smaller, but the properties are also different. And I have a few examples here of char. Now, these are test results which we uh, did with, with, by, by using the data from the International Flame Research Foundation database, uh, which were produced in, in this drop tube furnace. Here are mass loss or, in fact, carbon, char carbon conversion for anthracite on one hand, bituminous coal, and biomass. The residence time, 1.5 seconds. This is just a char, so it's not the complete fuel. And you see that the anthracite char very little reacts, very, to a li small degree, while biomass already can burn the whole char in this very short time. This is the same size, same mass of char, but, but the reactivity of the char is very, very higher for biomass. Uh, that higher reactivity has to do with the ash ingredients in, in biomasses. And now we come back to, to particularly the alkali metals and potassium. And quite uh, uh, recently we wanted to learn a little more about which factors affect the char reactivity. And we took uh, biomasses, biomasses and produced chars with different content of potassium just to see how the potassium influences. And here we have a biomass which we had completely washed before producing the char. So the potassium content was zero. And uh, then we added potassium even in different forms to the fuel, produced the char, and measured the char reactivity by TGA. And here you see the char oxidation rate percent per minute. Now, this is not in air, this is in carbon dioxide, uh, uh, where the same reactivity is, is uh, also easy to, to detect. And you see, in a funny way, almost linear uh, correlation. Uh, we didn't add enough potassium to see it leveling out later. Definitely it will do that. This is just an interesting thing to, to learn, that it's so sensitive to, to the... Uh, uh, potassium content. Uh, the reactivity summary, very high volatile content, extremely reactive char due to catalytic metals. Char oxidation by CO2 and H2O is also so fast that even in ordinary combustion, those reactions need to be taken into account besides the direct reaction with oxygen. So that is, we have seen it in, in, when modeling the particle burning, that uh, the gasification reactions need to be taken into account. Otherwise, we, we don't get it correct. This has a, a very important technical consequence. It is that since the char is so reactive, we, that explains why we can burn biomasses using the bubbling fluidized bed technology where all the char combustion takes place here in the bottom of the boiler instead of going to the circulating bend where the char particles have a long residence time in, a, in, a, in the circulation. This is needed for coal because of the char unreactivity. But here we can burn. This is much more simple. This is a less expensive solution. In fact, the, the bed itself here in a bubbling bed is slightly reducing, so there is not very much oxygen there. So the char conversion mostly takes place by CO2 and water vapor gasification. Uh, some words about nitrogen chemistry. It's not very well studied before. You would expect it to be similar to, to, to the coal and partly it is, but partly there are nice surprises. The nitrogen content in, uh, in different wood qualities you see here, and uh, uh, we are in the range of, of 
0.1 to 1 percent, slightly lower than for coals, but, but it's, it's still there. Uh, if we burn individual uh, particles, like here uh, in a laboratory, we can see nitrogen oxide formed. First, the volatile nitrogen oxide, and then this. Then later, this you, here you see the uh, the char nitrogen. Even if the char amount is is small, it still also produces nitrogen oxides. Uh, this is similar to, to coals, but of course the ratios between these two are, is depend, very dependent on the quality, on fuel quality. We were curious about this shape of the char uh, nitrogen oxide production. Why is there hardly no at the beginning of the char uh, oxidation and then there is the maximum production is just before the char is burnt out. It was maybe not practically so important, but it was a fascinating question to ask, so we, we studied it a little more. And in fact, we could repeat it. It was very reproducible. This is, here you see similar curves, th three, th three different temperatures. And in, in fact, the higher the temperature, the more clear was this upgoing trend. These are the carbon dioxide releases during the same tests. The explanation here is, is that the, uh, during char burning, we produce NO, which is a heterogeneous process. Part of the produced NO, of course, is, is diffusing away from the particle, but part of it can diffuse in, into the particle. And that is the key to this phenomenon. This ingoing NO will be reduced to N2 because of the active char. And here, again, the spe specific reactivity of the biomass chars gives the explanation. This you don't see with ordinary coals. But here, the, the reaction uh, goes this way. Uh, we have... Uh, we can model it, we can produce a standard model, and if we take into account the diffusion of NO and oxygen into the particle, we can, we can create a model which reproduces nicely this, this, this phenomenon. But uh, what was more interesting, we did tests in a large-scale unit. This is, one, uh, this is uh, the unit. It's a fluidized bed with a big freeboard. Uh, you see almost 40 meters, and uh, we wanted to try to sample inside such a furnace and see how nitrogen oxide is formed. This was uh, the topic. This particular unit burns mostly bark, but it also has additional fuels. Uh, in our test, which I'm going to show, we were burning only bark. And you see the nitrogen content in bark, bark is about 0.4. And uh, I will show our equipment because this was a, quite a challenging work. Now I have great respect to measurements in the laboratory with sensitive equipment. But this is a different game when the, the equipment grows to 50 meters by 10 meters. We uh, used uh, uh, large... Uh, sampling probes, pipes, and we put them into different locations in a systematic way. Uh, the probe was very uh, special design. In fact, it had four pipes inside each other. And the, the, the sample, the gas sample was taken, or it was continuous sampling. It was not just... Con con the, the gas was sampled in the inner pipe and fed to the analyzers. The inner pipe, the, the outermost part here is a ceramic uh, piece which allows a heavy, quick dilution of the sample and cooling to make sure there is no additional reactions in the pipes. 
but we should not cool too far because then we get condensation of material. So we needed to heat the rest of the pipe. So it was cooling, quick cooling and heating. And this uh, one worked very well, finally. Here you show it where we, an example where we located it inside such a huge furnace. Here are the fuel uh, feeding uh, shoots. And uh, uh, the probe was four meter long, so we reached almost two meter into the furnace from different sides. And this kind of a signal we received. And you see that we could detect uh, clearly ammonia. This is now from that particular pr position in the lower furnace. So we found a lot of ammonia, smaller amounts of uh, NO and hydrogen cyanide. And then we had to clean the pipe quite often and then get a new signal. Here, this is 1.8 meter into the furnace. Then we pulled it a little further back, so it was only 0.8 meters in, and we get an, another signal. And this we did in, in many locations in that unit. Here you see the locations. And there were a lot of interesting data. Here you see the lower furnace, nitrogen species, and then we had them all over here. And finally, the flue gas, nitrogen oxides, 92 ppm. There were a couple of uh, interesting details here which we focused. One was that we did find relatively large amounts of hydrogen cyanide, which we didn't expect, because in laboratory tests or in, in tunnel furnaces, you don't detect so much hydrogen cyanide in, by, for biomasses. It's almost all ammonia. But here, obviously, we have a chemistry in the lower furnace where some hydrogen cyanide also is produced. But uh, the more interesting uh, surprise was that uh, there was an extremely heavy uh, reduction of the fixed nitrogen along the, uh, the furnace. So in the lower furnace, uh, we had uh, uh, almost all fuel nitrogen converted to fixed nitrogen. But then when we went up and made measurements in different locations, here are those points are collected. The ammonia, hydrogen cyanide, NO contents went steeply down here, and then they stayed a while unchanged, and then they continued going up down, and finally were only about 10% of what was original. This is a very good uh, reduction. On the other hand, these boilers were not built for NOx reduction. So this was something that came by, by themselves. And we were quite curious how, how to explain this. Here we thought that we may try to use some modeling, because here the special feature with these units is that they have here, their air distribution is quite new, new type. It's very heavy jets. These air jets here are about seven, eight meter uh, with a velocity of 60, 70 meters when they come in. So they form a very, very heavy par uh, horizontal jet. And we thought that maybe these heavy jets have something to do with this effect. And we, we created a model where we simplified the furnace in a way that we, we assumed that most of the chemistry takes place in the jets. And uh, this is the approach we used. Uh, we first calculated the jet size and entrainment by approximated by computational fluid dynamics. And uh, uh, then we used, uh, for chemistry, we used the detailed chemistry. But the reactor assumption here was that we have a gradual entrainment of flue gas continuously uh, according to, to the entrainment uh, laws using so, so this uh, sweetening reactor, so smooth uh, uh, feeding of, of continuous feeding. This way we can put the complete chemistry in and see what happens. And here is the result of that calculation. This, this of course, assumes that we have a an very efficient uh, mixing uh, uh, radially 
which is not the case, but, uh, but that was the assumption here. Let's look at the results. This is the complete jet. This is 7.5 meter. It's a very long jet. And early, it's almost pure air, of course, and the temperature is low. But the temperature keeps increasing when more and more hot gas is mixed in. Yeah, I forgot to explain that we used as a feeding uh, material the measured primary combustion zone composition. So we wanted to see what happens to that gas when it's, it's going into the jet. And here, the temperature increases until we come to somewhere 800. And in this period, 2.5 meter, chemistry doesn't play a role yet. It's, it's frozen, it's too cold. But then uh, at somewhere here, the chemistry starts playing a role and we see that the entrained ammonia suddenly disappears. Some NO is formed and, and then they both disappear. So there is a steep decrease in the, the total fixed nitrogen until we have used all oxygen in that jet and uh, the final part, uh, no chemistry anymore, only entrainment of new flu, flu gas. Uh, this is quite remarkable. We, my students studied, call it this denox region, but it's, it's definitely not denox in the, in the meaning that we would add something, but it has similar chemistry, ammonia and nitrogen oxide in that jet form uh, conditions where where the denox chemistry becomes very active. Uh, then the same happens in the tertiary air jet. So we feed this gas composition in there, and we have a similar history. Cool period until we start again getting some similar reaction, NO, uh, TF, total fixed nitrogen goes down. But we are already in a quite low concentration here. And interestingly, the final NO or total fixed nitrogen we get with this modeling is about 100 degrees. And you remember that that was 90 or something that we measured out. So obviously, this technology to have these heavy jets, which were aimed to improve the combustion, not to do denox, were efficient in this way also. Uh, some summaries of this. Almost complete initial conversion of fuel nitrogen to fixed nitrogen gases in a lower furnace, but then 90% reduction. And we think that this is a special feature of this new air feeding technology. For circling in fluidized beds, the nitrogen chemistry is very different, but I, I can go, not, not go into that. There, the char reactions start playing a role. Corrosion, very important part of biomasses. And in fact, uh, that's the biggest challenge in the technology development for, for these boilers. Uh, it's caused by chlorides on tube surfaces. That's quite clear. There, everybody is agreeing. But then I will tell you later that we don't agree about all the details of this corrosion. Uh, this is the reason why the steam data, steam temp, uh, pro, uh, parameters are much lower in even the most modern power plants with this type. Uh, 500, 520 degrees is a very high number if we burn biomass fuels. While, as you know, in coal boilers, we can go beyond 600 and the materials issue is still not there. Uh, and a simple rule of thumb is that every 10 degrees we, we dare to heat superheater steam higher gives 2% more power in the term. You can check if, if, that, if that is a correct uh, rule of thumb, but in that range, which means that there is a big, big interest in into improving this situation. And our boiler manufacturing uh, colleagues, which we work together with, are extremely concerned about finding solutions to, to improve the efficiency, electric, the power production efficiency. Now we come back to chlorine and the ashes, and you see here, this is chlorine, and particularly these kinds of biomasses 
the, uh, the uh, agricultural uh, annual plants have, have high amounts, but also other biomasses have small amounts of uh, chloride. And I will show that it's sufficient with relatively small amounts to cause these problems. But before that, I want to go a little into the mechanism of chloride corrosion because it is interesting. This is a nice uh, 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 concept given by Nielsen et al. And it's quite often referred to. Here would be the steel surface iron chromium. And uh, here are the flue gases. And the key is this deposit containing chlorides. So far, everybody agrees. Now, in this uh, concept, the idea is that the chloride is, is activated in the deposit by reactions caused by sulfur dioxide from the flue gases. And the chloride is released as Cl2 gas. And that Cl2, chlorine gas, will react on the surface forming uh, volatile uh, iron and chromium chloride. This has been a difficult uh, uh, mechanism. Sometimes we, we have results which agree with this, but I will show you uh, some results which, which do not agree. And uh, you will see them here. We did do our laboratories, so when we do corrosion, we, we do it quite simple. We have a, a sample plate of different steels, we put some salt on top of them, treat them in a furnace controlled atmosphere. One week has shown to be a long enough time to, to get a good signal. And then we cut, cut the piece and mi do microscopy on, the, on that. And here I show one quite big study we did a while ago where we compared six different steels for chloride-induced corrosion. Six steels, starting with carbon steel, with most of it iron, and then going nicely. They are commercial steels, but systematically going to more and more advanced. These are austenitic stainless steels, and these are high alloy nickel materials. It's good to know here that if this costs one, this will cost about 40. So they are extremely expensive ones, these because of, of the quality of the steel and the nickel content. Now, then we did a, a full series of temperatures 450 to 600 with all these steels. And in fact, our students did all these tests, but under these conditions when we used only as base material alkali sulfate, no chloride yet, we got no corrosion for most of the steels except the steel number one, which is the low quality. And this is not caused by the salt. This is just uh, any oxidation of that material at high temperatures. But you could see that if we have no chlorides, we could easily have material temperatures up to 600 with all these materials without any problems. That would be very welcome, because then we would go be, ab be able to go higher temperatures, steam temperatures. However, when we start mixing chloride, small amounts of chlorides into this system, this is the one I showed to you. We put 0.3% chloride. We did it by putting sodium chloride or potassium chloride into this sulfate, melted it in advance, and, and uh, cooled it and crushed it. So it was very homogeneous. They mixed the, the chloride. And you see that now most mater these materials already start be showing heavy corrosion. This, these are high numbers. These are micrometers per week. And this is already visible by, by, by eye on that short time. And when we have 1.3% chloride, even the most expensive materials started showing clear corrosion at 525, explaining how, how this is really the obstacle to going to higher steam temperatures. But the interesting part here was these tests were made with no uh, presence of sulfur dioxide, which was the key in, in this, uh, uh, this concept. So we are quite sure that this SO2 is, is not needed, only that we have this deposit and we have high temperature, the things start happening. So we need some other mechanisms to 
trigger the, the corrosion. Uh, I don't go deeper into this, but the key is that when we do this kind of microscopy, we can see that uh, in a, after a weak exposure, the potassium is still on the surface, but it is no longer together with chlorine. So there is a split of potassium chloride, but this is not because of the sulfur dioxide. It's just straight on the surface. And we, we know from many tests it, it's an interesting formation of potassium chromate, the chromium layer on the surface. And that chromate formation has not really been so well reported before. Now it is a great interesting thing. And uh, which conditions does the chromate form? It doesn't form long while. It's just a, an intermediate which breaks the surface. Small amounts of alkali chlorides are sufficient for severe corrosion at 500 plus C. This is one conclusion. Alkali chlorides are corrosion, corrosive uh, also in absence of SO2. This alkali chromate formation has become an interesting thing. There is work going on. We try to understand a little better why uh, how, and how that happens. And it's, it's almost amazing because if you read the literature, the chloride corrosion has been there 30, 40 years, and we still keep arguing about the mechanistic things. But that makes life uh, fascinating also. Uh, how do the manufacturing companies react to this? Today, this is the most, the largest ever boiler uh, running only biomass. It's, uh, it's uh, 447 megawatt. The one I showed earlier was, uh, was mixture of biomass and, and uh, other fuels. This is only biomass. Here you see the Critical temperature is 535, so they have really extended it up to the maximum, but didn't dare to go further. And how do they do this? Because they also use agrobiomass, agri which is the more difficult one, containing chloride. One solution they have, which is interesting, this is Foster Wheeler in, in Poland. They, in a circulating fluidized bed, the, this is the furnace, the bed material is circulated back, and there is a feeding system of that back to the furnace. That feeding system is also a small uh, bubbling fluidized bed, and they put heat exchanger, the, the hottest superheater in there, and could increase the steam temperature some, somewhat by the contact with the hot sand without the contact of the flue gases and the chloride. This is uh, one way of, of, of showing how, how things advanced. Anyway, now uh, a few words about, still about ash deposits. Uh, corrosion is one aspect, but then the whole fouling issue is also another one. And uh, one detail we were interested in that we know that when we sample ash deposits, either with probes or with from the from the uh, boiler, we see that the deposits are not homogeneous. They look different on the tube surface as compared to flue gas. And it's quite obvious because there is a temperature gradient across the, the, the deposit. There was a lot of discussion about how does this temperature gradient influence the deposit with time. There were speculations. Maybe something happens. And we were wondering if we can study that in the laboratory. Now, it's not easy to create a steep temperature gradient in the laboratory. We have if you calculate, you can show that the, if this is the steam side, this is the tube wall deposit. So we can have, and this is flue gas, so if we have 1,000 degrees here, 500 here, steel will be, of course, about 5, 20, 30. But we can have a gradient of temperature of several hundred degrees, two, three, four hundred degrees in, in, in the deposit. So the material which is in the deposit has an interesting uh, environment. Finally, recently we were able to produce 
such a gradient also in the laboratory by, this is not a very clear picture, but the idea is we have a cooled pipe where inside temperature was 500 degrees, for instance, and then we can put our deposit sample here, but we have to cover the rest of the tube for, for heat transfer reasons, and then if we have only that part open and we have a hot furnace around, we can create something very similar and we can have a gradient inside that deposit. And uh, it was interesting. If we put a, a, a layer of salt on that uh, gradient condition and let it be there one day, this is what we saw. Here are the, this is the salt deposit. This is the cooled steel. Here has been the hot, hot environment. So instead of having a homogeneous particles which look like something like this, we can see that the outer side is almost molten, semi-molten, and uh, this is a mixture of, we used here as a model substance, is sodium sulfate, sodium chloride, which is a good, good model because we know that it's melting behavior very well. Uh, so this is logical. Here we have 500 degrees, and then somewhere here, this system starts melting at 730. So somewhere here, we have had a temperature of 730. But if we take a closer look at in, into this, we start seeing that also the, the, the type of the particles have changed. The particles didn't look like this when we put them in. So now they have this white layer on top, uh, and if we take one more close-up, we can see that, yes, each particle has received this white layer of material, and also the lower part looks different. Now, the center of this particle shows how they looked before, uh, or in, at the beginning, original salt mix. So we have the sodium sulfate gray mat matrix and sodium chloride crystals in that matrix. They were prepared by melting and cooling, so that's how, they, how it looks. But with 24 hours in this gradient, temperature gradient, the sodium chloride started uh, vaporizing and condensing to different particles, some kind of a vapor uh, transport, which uh, took place quite quickly. And now today we think that we, we understand that quite well so if the cold is down, hot is up, this is the way it goes. So simply sodium chloride starts vaporizing and is removed from the lower parts of the particles and then it hits the next particle. And the interesting thing is that the driving force here is, is extremely small temperature difference. These are small particles, 100 micrometers, but it's sufficient to transport material. And the consequence of this is that sodium, this chloride will partly go all the way to the steel surface, depending on the temperature con conditions, and can enrich high amounts of this, even small amounts of, of chloride. So this is something we want to study more. We have been able to model this phenomenon by, by a, a two-dimensional vaporization condensation model, and we can get some uh, uh, theoretical curves which fit quite well to the layer thickness. We can measure the potassium layer thickness as function of time. This is a, this is a new area. It's, we, we call it uh, gradient chemistry, chemistry in inorganic chemistry in temperature gradients. It can be important in other applications as well. Deposits change with time due to temperature gradients. Uh, volatile chlorides migrate towards the cooled tube surfaces and it may have an effect on corrosion properties of the deposit. Now, uh, these were examples of, of fundamental work which, su which support the de continuous development. Of course, one small piece of fundamental work never gives the final solution to the design of the, the units, but we've been very happy with our collaboration with these companies that they have worked with us many years, so gradually 
the information we have been able to produce and the communication we have with them has led to that, that we have been able to do uh, a lot of uh, uh, stuff which, which has shown to be directly useful. Uh, how will the future look? Uh, it's clear that biomass today is mostly used by, by combustion. In fact, the bioenergy from biomass is 95% still based on combustion. But we have heard many good presentations here in, in this conference as well about other optional ways of, of using the biomass to create uh, other energy uh, carriers. And uh, this will, of course, be a trend which will continue. And uh, here we are quite sure that there is a lot of space to, to research because whichever technology we start using here will be very sensitive to the biomass feedstock quality and we are back in the impurities, chloride, nitrogen and so on. This is one uh, highly interesting project going on. Uh, there are, I think, two or three plants in Scandinavia to go for biodiesel production uh, combined with ordinary pulp and paper mill. It has the advantage that the pulp and paper mill has a huge uh, uh, logistic system for, for biomasses and we have these, these biomass residues uh, which are not used in the plant which could be used elsewhere. And the idea here is to have a parallel line where we have a oxygen blown gasifier, gas cleaning, Physiotrop synthesis would, this, would, be, would be highly interesting. A lot of technical challenges there, a lot of interesting work to be done. Uh, but uh, that is one option. Uh, I would like to finish by, by uh, also stressing that it's, it's, it's good to do work, research work, which is not directly related to problems also in our area. And I, I want to show you one interesting piece of work by uh, our, one of our co-workers, uh, Andrei Pranovic. He was, he's a wood specialist and he was interested in analyzing one annual ring from from the wood cross section. And uh, he uh, had a technology to take that one annual uh, ring area and m microtome it into slices. So not only did he analyze the ring in average, but he wanted to know how that ring consists as functional type. And uh, this is what he found. He sliced it in 10 slices, that one annual ring, and he measured the concentration of the hemicellulose, the main components of the hemicellulose, galactans and mannans. And he could see that early in that annual ring, there was less galactans, and then towards the end of the growth of the annual ring, they increased. He also measured calcium al along the growth of the year of the tree. And uh, this is the result. So how to make use of this information in practice? I have no idea, but I think it's a fascinating piece of, of fundamental work. Uh, and this, with this, I want to acknowledge our collaborators and thank you very much. Thank you. So, thank you for a fine presentation and inspiring talk and a lot of work that has been done. 
with more areas for work that many people could pick up here. And uh, we have time maybe for one or two questions. So let me see your hands if there is. Do I see anybody who wishes to ask? Here's the specialist, you know. Try to get hold of him and get his feelings. Okay, yes, please. Elaine, go to the microphone over there and uh, state your name and affiliation. Oh, okay, hey, thank you. Uh, I have Elaine Oren, uh, where am I from? University of Maryland. <laughs> uh, I had two questions. One is sort of a, one has to do with the safety of forests. I know what, you're, what we were trying to do is clean up after the logging. But I always thought the debris that was out there was pretty good for the future growth. So some decisions would have to be made if you're going to collect it for biomass. Uh, that was my first question. And the second one was just a curiosity. When you showed a comparison between the model and the, and the measurements, and the measurements showed the funny little bump at the end and then went down. Do you remember that graph? Mm -hmm. uh, the model had the right trend, but it really didn't qualitatively show the bump at the end. It sounded like there was something totally new happening, possibly there, some acceleration process. So those were my two questions. Thank you. Thank you. The, the, the latter one, you referred to the nitrogen oxide yeah. production curve. Okay, I first answer that. You're right, it, it, it followed the, the smooth trend, but then there was a little interesting dip there, and it, it repeated itself. For, for, for most of them. That's a, that's a good point. We have been thinking about it, but we don't have a, a ready answer. Probably something happens to the particle at the very end of the char burnout, which, which was some collapse or something that, that suddenly gives an additional little kick. But, that, but that's, that's, that's open. That's a good, good question. About the sustainability of, of, of biomass use, that's a very, very important and, and big issue, of course. One thing that has, is happening in, in my part of the world, in the northern, northern Europe, uh, I think the situation is quite good. We, we, we keep close look, track at the growth of the forest versus the use of the forest. And, and the last uh, uh, five, six years, the growth has, has been much higher than the annual use. Uh, so there is, there is still an increase of the capacity. Then the other side is, of course, the, the uh, nutrients and the minerals which, which are removed, particularly when we start using these green parts of the tree, if they are also collected previously, they were left in the woods, and, with, uh, and, and that way the minerals stay mostly there. But if, if we start using them, then we remove them, and then it need, requires uh, some minerals to be brought back. There are big programs in, in using the ash from this uh, combustion uh, uh, systems and bring them back to the forest uh, as a fertilizer. So that's an issue also. Are there further questions? We can maybe take another one. Yep, please. Yeah, uh, Stephen Shi, uh, can I ask about, uh, can you make a comment on the PN 2.5 in biomass combustion? So, uh, I thought he had a question over there. I'm sorry, but no, then please let me see when who wants to comment. I can't see you. Okay, yeah. there. Ah, yeah, I ask sorry. again uh, about yes. the about the PM two point five in biomass combustion. Can, could you comment on that? Yeah. Uh, in in the large scale uh, units which we are, I have referred mostly to uh, particles are. are not especially uh, big issue because the the uh, the uh, cleaning system is good and and the combustion is efficient but most of the discussion connected with uh, with small particles and biomass use are connected with small scale uh, units ovens uh, small furnaces where the control is not so good and since they are many in in number and they are the control is not good that's a big issue, and that's a good area for, for improvement and research also, to have small-scale firing, which is efficient enough to control the, the, the PM, PM particles. 
So I think with this we should conclude this session. Let me thank Miko again. And uh, there may be a few housekeeping issues, but first we would like to have him open the certificate and have his photo. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, no, we are, oh, that way. Not upside down. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.